It's more than anyone could ever expect. SpaceX has just began stacking Starship's first Florida launch tower. Less than half a year after the company restarted work on a Starship launch pad located just a few hundred feet away from the existing Falcon launch facilities at NASA's Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A pad, a massive new launch tower has begun to take shape. Once it reaches its final height, that tower will become the second tallest rocket-related structure on the East Coast, only beaten by NASA's iconic and immense vehicle assembly building. Now, it could also reach that height far sooner than later. For Starship's Pad 39A facilities, SpaceX faces the unique challenge of organizing a major construction operation at one of the busiest and most important active launch sites in the US. In just the first half of 2022, LC-39A is on track to support 10 Falcon 9 launches, imposing unique constraints on adjacent Starship Pad construction. In a partial response to those challenges, as previously discussed on Tesla-Rati, SpaceX has taken lessons learned from Starbase Texas and optimized the assembly process of a number of pad components to limit the amount of work that will need to be done at the pad itself. For the first launch tower, SpaceX and its contractors moved exceptionally quickly and took just over three months after work on the first prefabricated section began to stack the structure to its full height of approximately 146 meters. Each of the nine sections was essentially bare, however, reducing the amount of pre-stack work but drastically complicating and increasing the amount of post-stack work required to turn the tower into something useful. For Florida's first Starship launch tower, SpaceX has spent more than three months assembling and meticulously outfitting the first six of nine prefabricated tower sections before the first stack. The sections SpaceX began stacking on June 21st already have a variety of railings, elevator shafts, doorways, walkways, hardpoints, plumbing, and more pre-installed. While each section and all abbreviated plumbing and hardware will need to be connected after each stack, that process should be far easier and faster than the methods SpaceX used in South Texas. Off-site, SpaceX is also making excellent progress assembling the pad's donut-like orbital launch mount and parts of the three giant arms that will eventually attach to Starship's first Florida launch tower, which is two for lifting and catching rockets and a third for stabilizing and fueling Starship. Much like the tower segments, there's a good chance that those Floridian components will be closer to completion than their Texan siblings when they eventually head to the launch pad for installation. Additionally, if SpaceX's experience in Texas is something to go by, Starship's first Florida launch tower could reach its full height just a few months from now. SpaceX is expected to periodically move more tower segments to Pad 39A over the coming weeks to complete the structural buildup of the Starship pad, where teams have also moved in propellant tanks and other support equipment. And as a piece of good news, SpaceX has just moved the second segment of Florida's OLIT 39A recently. As expected, it will be lifted up just a few hours later. Once the tower's structure is fully assembled, construction crews will add arms that are to be used for the stacking of the Starship on top of the Super Heavy booster. The company says the arms will also be used to catch the 9-meter wide Super Heavy booster when it comes back to Earth for landing. For the tower to be truly complete, SpaceX will need to connect one of those arms to ground supplies of Starship gases and propellants located at Pad 39A. Because 39A has never needed methane, Starship's fuel of choice, that step will also require the installation and activation of a new tank farm and plumbing capable of storing, rapidly subcooling, and distributing at least a thousand tons of liquid methane. Starbase Florida is making great progress, but a large amount of work still stands between SpaceX and launch readiness. Meanwhile, SpaceX is making good progress at Starbase, the original one. For now, SpaceX has been focused on preparing Starship S-24 and Super Heavy B-7 for static fire tests that could eventually qualify the pair to support the first orbital test flight. Besides that, the ground system is being rapidly prepared for the rollback of B-7, paving the way to the long-awaited static fire campaign one day not too far away. Typically, as Zach Golden said, the Orbital Launch Integration Tower, or OLIT, just performed a purge test of the cryogenic fuel loading system. It's being purged all the way up to the ship QD umbilical arm. The OLIT is slowly coming back to life after a recent major upgrade. Thanks to Lab Padre for capturing these wonderful moments.
Moreover, there are a lot of new deliveries recently. Prominent among them are parts of the next-gen prototypes, and we are very excited to see that SpaceX is developing the Ship 27 and B-10. And of course, we'd be even more excited if they are actually able to lift off. Interestingly enough, the Starlink payload adapter, or known as the PEZ dispenser, fitted onto the S-25 payload bay. Kevin Randolph shared some close-up photos of it via Twitter. Additionally, SpaceX is attempting to crush a Starship test tank. BE-7.1 is a bit like a miniature Super Heavy. Its three-ring top section is mostly similar to the top section of a booster and is reinforced with dozens of external stringers. Oddly enough, it is missing cutouts for grid fins, and the tank's forward dome does not have the reaction frame those hypothetical grid fins would anchor to. On the tank's bottom half, the same stringers are present, and the tank features a new design that squeezes four slightly shorter rings into the same height as three. The Super Heavy Thrust Dome, those rings enclose, is also a new design that expands the number of central Raptor engines from 9 to 13. It's unsurprising that SpaceX wants to test those significant design changes. SpaceX did technically conduct a similar test in mid-2021 with a test tank known as BN 2.1, but that tank featured a thrust dome with room for nine older Raptors that would have generated around 1,700 tons of thrust. B 7.1's testing will go a step further than BN 2.1 and use a structural test stand that should allow SpaceX to simulate the compressive forces Super Heavy Boosters might experience in flight, adding another dimension of stress on top of the 13 hydraulic rams that will simultaneously subject the test tank to the equivalent of around 3,000 tons of thrust. What is surprising, however, is the fact that SpaceX has waited so long to build and test a tank like B-7.1. SpaceX has already completed an entire Super Heavy Booster, uh, B-7, with all the design changes B-7.1 is meant to test and recently installed 33 new Raptor 2 engines on that prototype. A second upgraded booster, B-8, is also nearly finished. In that sense, B-7.1 is quite unusual and feels more like a reluctant, reluctant afterthought than part of a methodical development process. If B-7.1 suffers an unintentional failure during testing, SpaceX could be forced to abandon two nearly finished Super Heavy boosters wasting months of assembly and testing and rendering prototypes that are likely worth tens of millions of dollars all but useless. But honestly, SpaceX's decisions sometimes just baffle all of us. And with that, today's episode has come to its conclusion. If you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. And as a quick note, if you have advertising needs, you can contact us directly via email. Otherwise, as always, this is Kevin with Great SpaceX, and my team and I will see you next time. Until then, take care and have a good one.